This channel is part of the History Hit Network. For centuries, two great powers have battled for supremacy in Europe, the Habsburgs and the Ottoman Empire. The Habsburg side is personified by Prince Eugene of Savoy, a young nobleman who is prepared to rebel against his own king, Louis XIV of France. You should serve, not me, but God. No, never! As an impoverished prince, he embarks on what will be a brilliant career in the service of the Habsburgs. On the Ottoman side, Gurnush, a favorite in the harem, mother of two sultans, and to the end, a philanthropist and patron of the arts. Two empires that are completely different and yet have much in common. And they are always ready to go to war with one another. Mustafa, we should fall back. bloodbaths take place in which tens of thousands are left dead upon the battlefields. In times of peace, on the other hand, trade flourishes and the two powers engage in lively cultural exchange that even extends to medical techniques. What the devil are you doing now? Soon, however, the two great powers are at war again. On 9-11, September the 11th, 1697, Prince Eugene makes a decision that will change the world. Once again, Prince Eugene is prepared to risk everything, regardless of possible losses. I've told him, but he never listens to me. Get everyone ready to march. We'll surprise the Turks at the River Teza. Your Grace, we're almost a whole day's march away, and it's past midday. We'll put the infantry up with the cavalry. Each horse will be ridden by two fully armed men and go as fast as it can. And the heavy artillery? We'll leave it behind. In only one hour, we can be at the Tisa. You heard the order? Two men on each horse. Move! This was how, on September the 11th, 1697, an army of over 50,000 covered the ground in record time. On arrival at center, the Habsburg army faces a scene of chaos. The Sultan and the Ottoman cavalry are already over the teaser, and the artillery and baggage train are being ferried across. Almost 100,000 men in all. They are superior to us in numbers. Not if we drive them into the river. En avant! The bridge over the teaser is far too narrow to take all those fleeing to safety, and the Sultan's camp is paralyzed by the onslaught of the Imperial Army. If you love history, then you will love History Hit. Our extensive library of documentary features everything from the ancient origins of our earliest ancestors to the daring mission to sink the Bismarck. History Hit has hundreds of exclusive documentaries with unrivaled access to the world's best historians. We're committed to bringing history fans award-winning documentaries and podcasts that you cannot find anywhere else. Sign up now for a free trial and Timeline fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code TIMELINE at checkout. Ich 
As I see it, Prince Eugene's great gift as a military commander was his ability to read a battle, and most importantly, to recognize the moment when a battle has reached its critical point. When a battle is raging, there's a deafening roar of guns firing and men shouting, and you can see very little. At the critical moment, however, Prince Eugene knew what to do. Now it's time to bring up the reserves. Now it's time to put my last soldiers into the firing line. And if he has no soldiers left, then he goes into battle himself. soldiers were overcome with a real thirst for blood. They went for the Ottomans, shooting, stabbing, beating the hell out of them, and caused them far greater losses than they themselves suffered, especially as many Ottomans leapt into the teaser and drowned because they couldn't swim. The Battle of Centre lasted only a few hours, and Prince Eugene's tactic was a complete success. That afternoon, 25,000 Ottomans were killed, while the Habsburg army did not even lose 500. What is clearly noticeable is the total insensitivity of the commanders to the human losses, even on their own side. If you read Prince Eugene's correspondence, you see that he was very rarely personally or morally affected by the casualties in his forces. War was certainly waged more brutally against the Ottomans than against any other enemies, because the customary practice of taking prisoners and incorporating them into one's own forces didn't work with the Turks, who as a rule had a strong national consciousness and were also fanatical fighters. However, it would certainly be exaggerating to pretend that Prince Eugene was morally faultless or some kind of humanist. But in that respect, of course, he was no different from other generals of his day. Back to the camp. The defeated center is annihilating and puts an end to Ottoman expansion. In Europe, Prince Eugene's victory secures his reputation as a military commander of genius. The seal of Sultan Mustafa II captured at center can still be seen at the Museum of Military History in Vienna. Prince Eugene reported to the emperor that after the battle, serious explosions had destroyed the greater part of the booty, including the Sultan's war chests. 
Whether by chance or not, the following years see Prince Eugene making massive investments. Immediately after Santa, he pays off all his debts and has two further wings built onto his winter palace. The staterooms are decorated and fitted out with the greatest possible splendor and magnificence. The young Prince Eugene had rapidly aroused envy at the Viennese court. Why? Because his rise had been meteoric, and in particular, because he had flouted the rules of the day. He had no scruples about using his career to line his own pocket and showing off his success as opulently as possible. In short, he was a typical careerist. In addition, Prince Eugene purchases a plot outside the walls of Vienna, where he will build the Grand Summer Palace, later known as the Belvedere. In Hungary, he acquires the Danube island of Cepel, where he builds Ratzkiewer, now a hotel. It is the first of his palaces to be built by the architect Lucas from Hildebrandt, whom Prince Eugene summoned from Italy for the commission. From now on, all his main building projects will be entrusted to Maestro Gianluca, as the prince calls him. The emperor gives Prince Eugene extensive estates in the newly conquered territories. At the southern Hungarian village of Mohac, for example, where there had been an important battle in 1526. Today, a memorial commemorates the 15,000 soldiers who fell on that day. Prince Eugene has a valuation done on the land, which the emperor has assured him would be worth 80,000 guilders. When the valuation yields an estimate of 64,000, the hard-headed businessman Prince Eugene demands that the emperor make up the shortfall. Prince Eugene was one of the best and cleverest money men of his time. As such, he was an exception at the court of Vienna, which was constantly in debt and unable to pay the costs of the wars and the court household. Prince Eugene, by contrast, quickly makes capital out of his fame as a military commander, and not only in Central Europe, he goes to the London Stock Exchange and issues war loans, which are made out in his own name and not in that of the Habsburgs or the Emperor. These war loans became so popular that they sell out and immediately refill his war chests. The Emperor is unable to come up with the sum Eugene has demanded, but pays him in kind by giving him further estates in Hungary. Amongst these is the wine-growing area of Vilyany, which has been destroyed and plundered by the Ottomans. Prince Eugene has the villages resettled and builds up a model wine estate. Even today, the wines from Vilyany have an excellent reputation. The estate Eugene takes over has around 120 acres of cultivated land. Within 20 years, the prince has expanded it to five times the size. Vilyany still produces some of Hungary's best wines and is also known as the Bordeaux of the East. Its special feature is that ever since Prince Eugene's time, it has combined the best of both Western European and Balkan winemaking. But the emperor also made enormous territorial gains. The victory at center led to the Habsburgs acquiring the whole of Hungary and Transylvania. And the peace treaty of Karlovitz of 1699 finally brings 15 years of war with the Ottomans to an end. In the Ottoman Empire, the lost wars and a sultan who prefers hunting to the business of government are causing growing discontent. 
In particular, the leaders of the elite household troop known as the Janissaries refused to put up with the situation any longer. Where is our Sultan? He's not here, he's out hunting. All members of the Most High Divan, listen. It's enough, this can no longer go on. Not a month passes without some tax being increased. The Sultan and the Grand Mufti are responsible that tobacco and coffee are so highly taxed that the merchants can't sell their goods and even my own men have been waiting for months for payment. We won't put up with this for a single moment longer. Stoked up by the agitators, popular outrage rises to extreme levels. The cauldron around which the Janissaries gather for their meals is a powerful symbol for the elite fighters, reminding them of the time where the Turkic tribes were still nomads. This is where the new recruits pronounce their oath of loyalty and where discussions take place. On important issues, feelings run high. And what about our pay, which is already months overdue? There's no sign of it. We won't stand for it any longer. We've waited long enough. Let the weapons speak! When the cauldrons are overturned, the viziers and the sultan know that they cannot escape the rage of their elite corps. So it is in August 1703. The Janissaries storm the palace, assassinate the Grand Mufti, and depose Sultan Mustafa II. Nor does the peace last long in Europe. When in 1700 the Habsburg King of Spain, Charles II, dies without direct issue, both the Austrian Habsburgs and the French Bourbons lay claim to the throne. The result is the War of the Spanish Succession a conflagration that spreads all over Europe and lasts 14 years, the First World War of the Modern Age. The erstwhile pauper, Prince Eugene, has now become so powerful that he's set fair to become the richest and mightiest man in the Habsburg lands. His next step towards this goal is a comprehensive reform of the armed forces. The army is becoming more specialized and is now much more than just foot soldiers and cavalry. The artillery plays an important role. There are the sappers who specialize in earthworks and military engineering, miners who in sieges dig tunnels under the enemy's city walls, and a special corps responsible for transport and logistics. So what develops is in principle the beginning of a modern standing army, consisting not only of combat troops, but also auxiliary. In short, the beginning of the 18th century was a turning point in military history. Prince Eugene begins by unifying the army's weaponry. Until then, the colonel-in-chief of each regiment had decided what arms his men should carry. The fact that Eugene is now also a minister of state enables him to raise money and buy modern weapons. The great progress made in the field of weaponry naturally had an effect on tactics and strategy. The matchlock was replaced by the more modern flintlock. Furthermore, the troops no longer advanced in large pike squares, but formed lines, in which it was critically important to stay in line. That was the beginning of military drill, which hadn't existed before. Prince Eugene is now sent to fight the French in northern Italy. In order to reach the theater of war without facing the enemy, he has to cross the Alps, passing through the Trentino with armaments that in some cases weigh tons. This feat can only be compared with Hannibal's crossing of the Alps in Roman times. In Italy, Eugene is to meet a man with whom he will have a lifelong and fateful relationship, the Comte de Bonnevar. The actress and theatre director Rhea from Garland is one of Count Bonneville's direct descendants. 
In recent years, she's made an intensive study of her illustrious ancestor's life. The moment when Prince Eugene and Bonneval first came face to face was not really their first encounter, as they had known of each other for some time. They had had a previous encounter at a distance as members of different camps at the Battle of Luzara, and we know that they had great respect for one another. The interesting thing about Luzara was that both sides claimed victory and had masses celebrated accordingly, though actually it was probably a kind of draw. But even then, the young Bonneval stood out from the rest, because he was a talented officer and strategist, as was quite clear even though he was serving under Vendôme. After serious disagreements with the French generals, Bonneval defects to the enemy. Prince Eugene can make good use of him in his army. He not only has high regard for his gifts, but also has other reasons for liking his young compatriot. I'm not really sure, but it shows off your broad shoulders particularly well. Do you think so? Mm-hmm. But my hips? Your hips are quite formidable, but the waistcoat is too large. Hmm. I will ask my tailor to alter it for you. Now you are a real emperor's man. More like a grey mouse. <laughs> L'élégance was not invented in Vienna. <laughs> <laughs> Prince Eugene is hoping Bonnevar will give him something that, in spite of his rise to power, has been denied him thus far. True friendship and an inspiring relationship with another human being. Leibniz writes, he wishes to find an academy in Vienna. Hmm, but that can't be any great problem for you. I'm going to write to the emperor about it today. I don't know how I can thank you enough, dear friend, for having introduced me to this great thinker. I have something more for you. The works of my good friend, Fenelon. Do I see greed in your eyes? Forgive me, dear friend. <laughs> it was simply pure joy over the written word that caused me to lose my composure. May I? Prince Eugene had ja nicht nur mit Prince Eugene did not just cultivate intensive contacts with philosophers and other great minds of his time. He also set great store by fine art and by commissioning the best artists to work for him in Vienna. To this end, he not only paid large sums of money, but also used diplomatic means to bring works of art to Vienna, sometimes from the remotest parts of the world. The Baroque has now spread to Constantinople. A new century has begun. Gulnush has lived through a number of turbulent decades. Misrule on the part of its sultans has plunged the Ottoman Empire into a serious economic crisis. The Janissaries demand the head of the sultan, Gulnush's son, Mustafa. I know that the Sultan spends too much time out hunting. If you spare his life, I will see to it that he abdicates. My younger son, Ahmed, is prepared to listen to your demands. Your son is inexperienced in the business of government, and he has spent too long in the cafes. If he were to let himself be guided by your wisdom and the experience of the Grand Vizier, we would serve him unconditionally. Women taking part in ruling was the result of various factors. One was the acquisition of power in the palace by the families of the Grand Viziers. This happened when the Sultan was too young to guide the fortunes of the land, that is, to deal with political and military matters. 
In this case, the Grand Vizier ruled together with the Sultan's mother. But this form of regency ended in the 17th century. Gurnush played a major part in bringing about the cultural heyday that the Ottoman Empire enjoyed under her son, Ahmed III. Handwritten books are, of course, wonderful, but they only reach a very small number of people. Books have been printed in Europe for almost 250 years now. Look what masterpieces they have created. And as a result, their holy book has become widely known. They are now even able to print books in Arabic script. We have to keep pace with them. Ibrahim Mutafereke, a Transylvanian who converted to Islam, is a key figure in this development. He supplies the Ottomans with the technical knowledge for putting ancient manuscripts into print. He obtains an audience with Prince Eugene, who by this time has the largest library in Europe. In times of peace, the prince is happy to pass on his knowledge to an Ottoman delegation. My library is divided up into three groups. Each group has its own color. Red for history and literature, blue for theology and justice, and yellow for the natural sciences. May Allah grant that even just one of my stories may appear in such a book. Inshallah. Gentlemen, please. A special feature of the library is that the books are all bound in the finest leather. Of course, it would interest me if it was possible to obtain this leather directly from Constantinople. The prince means he would like more of these Janissary skins. Well, it's been a long time since the last one. We have none left. <laughs> no, 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 no. Let's be serious. That is goatskin what we call Morocco leather. However, it's hardly made in North Africa anymore. I have heard that you have the best goatskin tanners in the world. It is our intention to use this leather for binding the books of our Sultan's library as well, so there will be no shortage of it for you. The prince certainly needs large quantities of leather. With the help of Bonival, who is well connected with great thinkers such as Voltaire, Leibniz and Montesquieu, Prince Eugene succeeds in bringing his library up to 15,000 volumes. It now forms the heart of the Austrian National Library. Neither Emperor Charles VI nor Maria Theresa were in a position to buy Prince Eugene's estate outright, and it all came onto the market. His niece Victoria generously sold it off and the Habsburgs bought it. In the case of the library, however, they came off badly because the contract specified that Victoria should be paid a certain annuity for life. Then she lived much longer than they had thought she would, and in the end, the Habsburgs paid less for the palaces than they did for the 15,000 books. These are the books that I've brought from the library of Prince Eugene. When Ibrahim Mutaferika returns to Constantinople, Gulnush is dying. But until the very end, she remains the most important woman in the Ottoman Empire. So this is a book that belonged to that cruel man. It is good to see that even he feels love for beautiful things. Sometimes one compensates for the ugliness of life with the beauties of eternity. In 1715, Gulnush passes away. During her lifetime, Gulnush had a mosque built to match the Yeni Jami, the new mosque on the European side of Constantinople. But her mosque, the mosque of the new sultan's mother, or Yeni Valida Jami, is situated in Uskudar on the Anatolian side of the city. 
neither mosque bears the name of its creator. This seems to reflect the fate of the great Ottoman women of this period. However influential they were during their lives, their names did not survive in the collective memory of their land or even on the city plans. Only a year after Gulnish's death, the almost 20-year-long period of peace between the Ottomans and Habsburgs comes to an end. Once again, a huge Ottoman army is on the march, this time towards Belgrade. Near the fortress of Petrovaradin in present-day Serbia, Prince Eugene once again succeeds in driving the Ottomans back. Allegedly by tricking them, it is said that he had his horses shod back to front. But can a horse walk with its hoofs shod the wrong way around? Or is this perhaps just another of the many legends surrounding the life of Prince Eugene? It is basically no problem putting the horseshoes back to front. There is even an illness which is still treated this way. The human footprints point in one direction and the hoof prints in the other. In theory, this tactic could send an opponent in the wrong direction, but it would not deceive a seasoned reader of animal tracks. In June 1717, Prince Eugene is once again besieging the fortress of Belgrade which is held by the Ottomans. There he is visited by his old comrade-in-arms, Bonivar. Your bones can't be the youngest anymore either, Maréchal. The bones are my smallest problem, but my gout, mon ami, my gout. It's been a very long time, Eugene. I hear that you got married. Yes. But you don't seem very pleased. Come with me. I have something for you. Ever since his days as a neglected youth, Prince Eugene has yearned for real friendship. What is it? Emeralds? Diamonds? So you are giving me a wedding present? No. It is to celebrate 15 years since our first encounter with one another in a battle. So, an anniversary gift? See it as a tribute to our indestructible friendship. Indestructible, yes. Prince Eugene has besieged Belgrade for two months, bringing off a number of tactical masterstrokes. Then, the Ottoman army arrives to relieve the fortress. The Battle of Belgrade is the prize example of a battle that Prince Eugene should, in fact, have lost. The fortress he is besieging is probably the strongest in Europe, can only be besieged from the south and possesses a very strong garrison. Then the Ottoman army approaches from the south and he is caught between two fronts. Now something happens that has been typical of his whole career a stroke of luck at the right moment. This time, one of his mortars scores a direct hit on the fortress's munitions depot and blows it sky high. Then, he launches a brilliant attack on the Ottomans to the south, surprising them by night and putting them out of action in spite of his inferior numbers. This puts him in a position to take what is the most important fortress in southeastern Europe. At the Treaty of Pesanovitz, the Habsburgs gain the Banat, Little Wallachia, and further territories in northern Serbia. Thanks to Prince Eugene, the Habsburg territories have now reached their greatest ever extent. However great his successes were on the battlefield, he still had remarkably little success in the field of human relationships.
Yours is bigger than mine. <laughs> Are you jealous of me? I wonder. What have I gained from all my honors? I risked life and limb for this. What do you expect? That you finally do something for me. Have I done nothing for you? Didn't I promote you to the rank of general after you'd come to me as an outcast? Haven't I showered you with gifts? Forgive me, but I'm not a harlot. And ten years have passed since you made me a general. Others have received high offices, and I have not. Though God knows I've done more than them. So what do you want? I want the governorship of Sicily. Sicily. And I will ensure you a lifelong supply of oranges and lemons. That is quite impossible, dear friend. I have already promised the governorship to Count Vallis. You've done what? I can't give it to you. You're a foreigner to the House of Habsburg. With all due respect, and what are you? Then at least give me Osiek. No. I'm sending you as a commander of artillery to the Netherlands. There you'll be deputy to Priet. It is a very well endowed position. Priet? But Priet is your deputy in the Netherlands. <laughs> You're making me a deputy to your deputy? Priet is a very capable man. Everybody knows what a corrupt swine he is. Enough. I cannot do more for you than that. You will soon receive the order when you have to present yourself there. Every little lout gets caught one day by gout. Bonneval ridicules Prince Eugene in song before leaving the Vienna. Ah, Frenchman, here's the lowest dregs he even wanted. Or see, Eck. I dreams of being on a red, but doesn't have sufficient bread. Drink, brother, drink your ale. In Vienna, honor is for sale. Drink, brother, drink your ale. In Vienna, honor is for sale. A letter from Brussels informs Prince Eugene that Bonneval has seriously insulted him and has joined a group of renegade noblemen who are openly expressing their hatred of Habsburg rule. Prince Eugene's deputy in Brussels immediately has Bonneval arrested. Now we see that Prince Eugene has a very unforgiving side to him. He recommends that the court of war should sentence Bonneval to death for high treason. The unusual thing about Count Bonneval's death sentence is that the Emperor only pronounced it after having been put under extremely strong pressure to do so by Prince Eugene, which in turn is also very odd because of the long-standing close friendship he had with the French Count. There may have been a woman behind this ruthlessness. A certain Countess Eleonore from Batiany had long resented Bonneval's influence. Whose turn? Yours, my friend. Bonval. He is an absolutely degenerate being. Samoral. Tout à fait. You're right. <laughs> you are right. The death sentence was reduced to imprisonment and Bonneval was incarcerated for a year at the infamous prison of Spielberg in southern Moravia. Then he was released on the condition that he never set foot in the Holy Roman Empire again. 
It was around this time that Prince Eugene's magnificent garden palace was completed, in a record time of only three years. Designed by Lucas from Hildebrandt, it is one of Austria's finest Baroque buildings. Eugene is at the height of his power. He is Imperial Field Marshal, President of the Imperial Court of War, and Governor both of Milan and the Austrian Netherlands. The French gardens featuring terraces lined with figural sculpture make Prince Eugene's new acquisition of Schlosshof an outstanding example of Baroque splendor. The festivities are also truly Baroque. To the horror of his guests, Prince Eugene allows a tame lion from his menagerie to roam around freely at banquets. Intoxicating festivities are no longer a part of Count Bonival's life. After his release from prison, he heads for Constantinople, the capital of the Habsburg's arch enemy. With hardly any financial means, he makes it to Sarajevo, where, for strategic reasons, he converts to Islam. After Bonneval had converted, the Sultan summoned him to Constantinople and even provided him with a house. There, Bonneval wrote a memorandum for the Sultan, principally containing his ideas for the modernization of the Ottoman army. The Sultan was so profoundly impressed by his reform proposals that he commissioned Bonneval to take over leadership of his gunners. As commander of the artillery, his name is now Hombaraja Ahmed Pasha, Cannons Ahmed Pasha. Prince Eugene is furious when he hears about Bonneval's defection to the Ottomans. He remembers his mother's secret weapon. House, Court and State Archive in Vienna, where parts of the Prince's correspondence are preserved. Amongst these papers is Eugene's request to the Emperor to have Bonneval poisoned in Constantinople as a traitor. Das Interessante an diesem geplanten und versuchten Anschlag war, the interesting thing about the attempted murder is that once again, it was apparently at Prince Eugene's insistence that the emperor signed an order that instructed the ambassador in Constantinople to have Bonneval assassinated. It even says precisely what poison was to be used, namely diamond powder, as was apparently common at the time. What is interesting for me is seeing the emperor's signature under the assassination order. The attempt on Bonneval's life fails, and the count enters a dervish monastery as a member of the Mevlevi order, which is well known for having an especially tolerant world view. Levy Order still performs a special ritual every Sunday, the Dance of the Dervishes. In the whirling prayer, the members of the Sufi Brotherhood gradually enter a trance-like state. Claude Alexandre de Bonivar, now Hombaraja Ahmed Pasha, dies in 1747. His grave is at the cemetery of the Mevlevi order in the heart of Istanbul. 
Only a few yards away is the final resting place of the pioneer of Ottoman book printing, Ibrahim Mutaferika. At the end of the 17th century, the Ottoman Empire entered a period of political and economic decline. Periods of decline are always extremely interesting because the demise of the old makes room for new developments. The time in which Gulnush Valida Sultan lived was just such a period. The only surviving buildings commissioned by Amatullah Rabia Gulnush to give her her full name are a mosque and a fountain in Istanbul. In her lifetime, however, she was an important figure on account of her cultural open-mindedness and her charitable activities. Historians of the Ottoman Empire have not accorded Gulnish the importance she really deserves. She's best known today as the mother of Ahmet III. The reign of Ahmet III was a period of exceptional creativity in the arts and architecture. Another example of exceptional creativity is Lucas from Hildebrand's transformation of Prince Eugene's country seat of Schlosshof. It may not be the largest, but surely the most elegant palace. Here, the aging prince enjoyed many summer days amongst a small circle of selected friends. Everything here is wonderful. Everything is in harmony. This conjunction of Mars and Jupiter not only means constant happiness, but also an irrepressible, unyielding will and triumphs on all levels. And then Jupiter in the 12th house, standing for the love of the good and beautiful, the love of art. But Mars, in opposition to Uranus, not only shows your determination, but also your cold-bloodedness and brutality. But... but I see no sign of Venus. You are a Mars without a Venus, your grace. And Pluto, in the sixth house, I see a lot of darkness. I see an old age of loneliness, sadness and pain. Pain. Enough. You are dismissed. A life without Venus? <laughs> I hate astrology. Oh. I abandoned this superstition long ago when I left Paris. Uh -huh. Ah. This is a Citrus Limonis. I had it sent from Sicily. Mon cher, wherever do you get all these unknown plants from? <laughs> oh, my child. I have agents in every port in Europe. When they are not having to pursue someone for me, they buy me the most beautiful animals and plants brought in by the trading ships that enter the harbor. Mm -hmm. Here, Maestro Gianluca has really surpassed himself. The terraces go down almost as far as the river. One, two, three, four. Five, six, seven. Hmm. One more than the Emperor. <laughs> Although Prince Eugene was a weary man, the Emperor compelled him to go to war one last time. Now he was, in a sense, a victim of his own fame. He had become a kind of secret weapon, a trump card. And particularly in this last war, I think that he allowed himself to be wound up and put into action against his own will. Actually, he wanted to spend his twilight years in one of his palaces. The bold fighter and ruthless commander has now had his day. In his last years, Prince Eugene devotes himself even more intensively to his palaces and collections. Wien.
weil in der Barockzeit natürlich in der Barock Ära Vienna was nominally an imperial court, but it was regarded all over Europe as backward, provincial, and mostly somewhat impoverished. Prince Eugene, on the other hand, was not only a war hero, but was well known as a rich and intelligent patron of the arts. His reputation naturally rubbed off on Vienna, and for many years after his death, it helped the city to improve its image. Even as an old man, Prince Eugene retains all his high offices, and even seems to be a kind of secret emperor. He, a foreigner, has expanded the Habsburg territories to their greatest ever extent, and has at the same time commissioned architectural treasures of monumental grandeur. In his old age, he withdraws increasingly from society, until at the end, he is lonely and only talks to his animals. Roar. Lion. Roar. Roar! When the noble knight dies in the evening on the 21st of April, 1736, it is said that the tired, tame lion woke up and roared so loudly at the Belvedere that he could be heard far away within the city walls. Prince Eugene's heart is laid to rest in Turin. His other mortal remains are placed in a chapel named after him in St. Stephen's Cathedral. He went as he had come as a foreigner, and yet he made absolutely sure that he would never be forgotten. <laughs>